Then we move on to response to intervention. Okay, so what used to be used in schools was what's known, and, and a lot of schools still use this honestly, is the wait to fail model. So what they do is they wait to see a discrepancy between achievement, so how well this student is doing in school, and a discrepancy in IQ. So IQ, which is in the normal range, um, and then a, a discrepancy in achievement, so achievement that's low. But the problem is, I mean, we could wait um, years for, for this to, to occur with the student falling further and further behind. So we make that identification, and then if there is that discrepancy, it's usually um, a specific learning disability that, that's the cause of it. Okay, so in moving away from the waiting to fail model, we move towards uh, RTI. So in RTI, <clears throat> we talk about... Um, an academic intervention pyramid. I particularly like this one. So the majority of students would fall into this yellow range down the bottom here. So it needs based learning in tier one. It's a multi-tiered system and it can usually go up to, to four tiers. A multi-tiered system. This particular model only has three. So the majority of students fall in here. If they need further interventions beyond supports that have already built in. Remember we just talked about scaffoldings, um, scaffolding in the first um, first segment of, of this lecture, of this chapter, right? So we can have resources still available to general education students. So we can have reading academies, we can have math academies, we can have tutoring supports, right? Um, we have still regular screening programs for students like hearing, vision, etc. Okay, we have access to counseling services. Hopefully you've built differentiated instruction, which really is a component of universal design, right? We can have some interventions. Um, so, you know, if we have a student say that, that um, wears glasses, I mean, we have them maybe use stuff with larger print and, and you know, if they have a very heavy prescription for, for their glasses, etc. Um, so what happens when a student falls outside of this, needs more support? Well, then we pass on to Tier 2. Okay? So target students participate in differentiated learning, differentiated learning in addition to Tier 1 interventions to include individualized assessments, individualized interventions, and referral for special design interventions as needed. Okay, so in this case, they're having a larger, it's increasing the intensity of the intervention, and obviously it decreases the number of students because less students would qualify for this. So we still have all the original resources, but then we look at individual assessments to make sure the student is progressing appropriately and what specific problems they seem to be having. We look at individual interventions. So for instance, you know, let's, let's say the student has a sensory issue and you know, they have a hard time decoding auditory information when there's a lot of ambient noise around. You know, we might use an amplification system or an FM system, a frequency modulation system for the student. So they have a set of headphones on or plugged into their, um, their hearing aids so they only hear the teacher in that setting. That would be a specialized intervention, an individualized intervention. Okay. We can also do referral to specially designed interventions as needed. So there can be a certain degree of pullout. So reading support, reading recovery programs, etc. The student, um, you know, with these lighter interventions. Um, still isn't making the achievement, we can put them into Tier 3, so specially designed learning. So students will have accommodations, modifications, through a special edge, through special education, IEP, gifted plan, where they're placed on an actually, you know, a plan, okay, with very specific interventions. So Tier 1 and 2, um, 
you know, we, we really can apply a lot of universal design in creating inclusion for those learners. You know, in Tier 3, we're, we're talking about uh, heavier accommodations, larger accommodations, modifications, and, and an IEP process. So it's really a progression, right, of, of response to intervention. We talk about every student kind of, you know, being, being looked at over time, progressing through, and eventually everybody gets the services that they, they need to have. Okay, so how does assistive tech, or sorry, how does AT, RTI, and UDL, wait, using those acronyms really isn't good universal design. We want to make information clear, you know, not use acronyms so the majority of the students get it if they hadn't got it already. So, how do we, how do we mix together assistive technology, response to intervention, and universal design? Well, like you just saw in that pyramid, a lot of universal design is incorporated in there so students have the same scaffolds, the same supports, um, whether they happen to be in an intervention or not. They happen to qualify for special education services or not. The same applies to assistive technology, and I'll give you one very clear example. So, if you're talking about a writing task, and students have to write something. Usually pre-writing activities involve what's traditionally known as, as webbing and clustering and, and brainstorming, right? So you jot down some ideas, you see how they're linked together, and you usually do that in a graphic format. Well, we can use programs like uh, Inspiration or other semantic and cognitive mapping tools for all students, not for, just for students that, um, that have a hard time, that struggle, with putting concepts down on paper and linking them together. We can use that for all students, for the betterment of all students, to have access to those tools to learn that process. So in doing that, we're designing things universally, right, by giving them access all to assistive technology.